Probably uh, we will start. Um, this will be our last session of uh, today. And we'll begin with a round table discussion. Uh, no, it won't. It won't be our last discussion today. We have Hong Ding afterwards. Yeah, I said last session. Okay. What last is, okay. session has the two, um, two, um, what, what can I say? <laughs> One is a discussion and then uh, we'll have another talk because I'm chairing a proposal. Uh, Great. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, so, and we'll have a first um, discussion sessions on the key questions and challenges um, uh, in the correlated topological frontier. And then we'll have a talk uh, by Hong Ding um, after this. So Yuji Matsuda and I have been thinking about how to address this. Um, and I, I thought that, uh, as I said to Pierce and Rajiv and you see that this is a, such a grand, uh, ambitious uh, title for a 45 minute, but uh, we can still try our best uh, to think That's about it. That's our idea. Good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I thought that, okay, why don't we start uh, thinking about, because topology is used uh, in uh, many different contexts. Um, so we put some three uh, categories, you know, theory, materials, and measurement, and uh, and uh, of course, in each of those uh, boxes or circles, uh, we have our own questions. Um, obviously, in theory, the classification is your soul range entangled state, such as SPT, are probably one of uh, most um, kind of successful ones uh, so far. Um, and the topological order is uh, long range entanglement, such as quantum spinnaker. We are still kind of uh, looking for um, this type of excitations. Uh, materials wise, we know that there are this uh, categorizations of different phases, topological insulator, topological superconductor, quantum magnets, and, and then one can ask for artificial superstructures um, where one can engineer the materials um, to get the uh, what we are looking for. And then there are measurement of um, detecting uh, topological excitations, um, including spectroscopy and transport. Uh, my own personal perspective in this, um, for me, is this bridges. Uh, so I like to bridge theory to materials and theory to measurement. And uh, uh, obviously that's my own personal perspective. I like to understand how can find these fractional excitations in what materials, what are the candidate materials where I can find such ones. Um, and uh, I thought that that's just my personal key challenges. Um, and that means that there are other people's uh, in audience for sure. Uh, we'll have a um, different perspective. Um, so I, uh, Yuji and I decide to ask some of us um, to tell us uh, their personal um, ideas and where we are going, future directions, what is their own key questions um, to address. Um, so here is uh, five people who has, um, I asked them to prepare one slide and you can see how dense they are. <laughs> but uh, we'll have uh, each of us um, um, talk about their um, questions and directions. Uh, and we can have a few, we'll take a few questions from there uh, and move on. Um, given 45 minutes, uh, maybe we may not be able to finish uh, everyone. Uh, the order has been simply decided by the time that I received the slide. So it's uh, not much <laughs> thought into the order, okay? So apparently peers, you sent me the last. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, here's uh, and Andre. Do you want to speak about? And I can click uh, for you. Yes, please. So um, you'll be the slide advance. It's still one slide, but it has a little animation just to make it easier on the eyes. Um, so, um, as you're well familiar, Haldane model for um, electrons was a second nearest neighbor hopping on a Kagoma, sorry, not Kagoma, on a Hanikam lattice. Um, is one of the cornerstones of the non-interacting topology, at least uh, the way it entered in the modern condensed matter. Um, besides that, it turns out that realizing the set um, model on an actual graphene um, is far from easy because the spin orbit coupling is just too small. And so it came maybe somewhat unexpected that you could do this actually with bosons rather than fermions. Um, if you take an ordinary ferromagnet, seems to be very simple, such as this cryonium chromium triiodide, um, and it's a Hanikam lattice material. If you now look at the spin fluctuations around the ordered state, they can be represented, for instance, by Holstein Primakov bosons that hop on a lattice. 
and it's the zelushinsky Maria interactions on this lattice that give you the imaginary second neighbor hopping and therefore berry curvature. So what you see are the two magnon bands, the orange and the blue have opposite and equal churn numbers, and the berry curvature for the bottom band is shown in K space in the plot on the right. Now the question is, how would you probe this experimentally? What would you see? And um, going back to 2010, the, there are proposals coming from uh, Patrick Lee, Nagaoza, Hoshu Kutsura, later Boy Murakami and company um, that put the framework of computing essentially the car plus large and anomalous velocity to build the analog of the anomalous Hall effect, except these are bosons, they're not charged, so we're looking at the thermal Hall effect. The same effect that uh, Yuji Matsuda and Fo Nong uh, were measuring in ruthenium trichloride. And if you look at this formula, what it tells you is what enters it, um, is the quantity omega, which is the very curvature. So that looks very similar to the fermionic case. What is different is this function C2, um, which Fon also introduced in his talk. And you could immediately, okay, it's some complicated function involves some, some integrals, but if you look at the expansion of it, which is on the right-hand side, you could immediately see that neither in the high and no low temperature regime is this function approaching a constant. So generally you end up with something which is temperature dependent, um, depends on your bands and is generally non-trivial. And so hence kappa xy is not going to be quantized, but it is proportional to, if you will, the weighted um, value of the Berry curvature integrated to a Brillion zone. Hey, Yank, I wonder if you could click on the next or click somewhere. So this is what you get for chromium trial that, you know, depending on parameters of the model, you get non-zero value of kappa xy and fundamentally it comes from the bands having Berry curvature. And if you wouldn't mind clicking again, um, I will jump straight to um, one of the questions that featured promptly in um, yesterday and, and today, which is how we do understand the ruthenium trichloride. Um, and here are the slides that you all saw from um, Matsuda Sensei's talk yesterday, um, showing proposal that there may be a range of field where the half integer quantized plateau of thermal conductivity can be observed. And one of the questions that was raised is that if you for a second forget about this possibly being a of quantum spin liquid with non-trivial edge, chiral edge, is there any other source um, of the thermal Hall effect? And in light of what I just told you, you might expect that there may be topological contribution coming simply from magnets. I wonder, Frayang, if you could click one more time. Um, and so here, this is just one example. Um, Heyang gave a beautiful talk in which he introduced the terms that are written here in the Hamiltonian, the Kitaev term K, as well as the gamma, gamma prime. Here we took some realistic values of these parameters. Um, and if you plug them in, you end up with um, low lying magnon bands. So here they're shown with blue and, and orange. Um, there is a small gap, it's hard to see. So um, Right, right there where Haiyang is pointing, they have equal and opposite churn number. And the story is very similar to what I just told you about chromium triiodide. You could compute kappa over T, the thermal Hall effect. And you know it has a feature um, that looks somewhat like experimental data from phonon at low temperatures. And now if you might click one more time, Haiyang, this is the last time I promise. Um, what I'd like to bring uh, to your attention is that when you compute this formula, there are no adjustable Fudge parameters, meaning that you start from some model of magnons, and at a given temperature in a given field, you get what you get, right? Um, and by this, I mean that the absolute values in milliwatt per Kelvin squared per meter are the absolute units of what you get from the theory. And you could see the left-hand side plot the theory, compare here with the data from Matsuda Sensei and from Fu Nong, and what you see that the vertical scale in this absolute units is about a factor of 10 smaller in the theory compared to the experiment. Um, so here I'd like to leave it as an open question, what to take off it, right? One might say that, well, perhaps the fact that magnons aren't enough to give you the full signal is an indication that indeed you need a chiral edge and this is a indirect evidence of chiral, um, of, of a uh, Kitai of chiral spin liquid. The difficulty with that is the temperature dependence. If you look at um, Ong's data as well as the theory, 
you see the curve as a function of temperature is not constant. If this was a fermionic effect, you would expect a constant roughly at the value right there where Heliang is pointing. Um, this is not what's seen. So if it is then a bosonic effect, such as I'm proposing here, the question is what kind of boson? And it might be possible that there are other contributions that we don't fully understand. It may be that the model that I wrote on the previous page was just too simplistic, and this is still an open question. So I'll probably stop here. Okay, um, thank you, Andre. Um, so maybe anyone can add more on this. Um, Rajiv and yeah. Youngbeck have hands may, up. May I add something? Okay. Yes, please. Because, because, um, Rajiv has his hand up too. Because uh, we studied this uh, thermal hole effect from topological megalon very extensively. Yes, and um, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I should have cited your papers, young man. No, it's, not no, it's fine. It's, it was already mentioned in full stock. That's fine. So, so point is that we tried uh, many, many different parameters um, for this thermal hole um, effect. And uh, of course, you know, one criterion was that well, uh, we had to use uh, reasonably realistic parameters, right? For example, you know, the magnetization, um, magnetization data and also uh, you know the field scale where the transition from zigzag to the uh, polarized etc cetera, etc cetera. But, but nonetheless um, more than one parameter set you know can reasonably fit those uh, um, values of uh, experimental data so we tried all sorts of stuff and and um, the, the, the magnitude of this effect varies a lot, right? So in, in, in your parameters, looks like you only get a 10%. But uh, uh, in, in our paper, if you look at our paper, uh, the value is actually almost 50% of uh, half quantized value, for example. That's right. So, but the point, my point is that it changes, uh, you know, the, the actual magnitude changes. It depends on things like, you know, magnum gap and all kinds of other parameters. <clears throat> So generally, you know, generally, it is not true that uh, it always comes out like factor 10 smaller, right? So, so I don't know. I mean, we didn't um, search for extensive, you know, uh, we didn't search for all possible parameters. So you know, we, we stopped at some point. And it is true that, uh, the, you know, the biggest contribution we could get was like about 50% of uh, half quantized value. Um, um, so you know there could be other contributions, but uh, but but I, I would say uh, um, if you actually change the parameters, you may get a much larger value. The point is that here the churn number is one, mm -hmm. right? So we, you know churn number is one. So therefore, it really depends on the details of the magnum bands and things like that. So oh. also uh, uh, you know the bands. I, I, I was looking at your magnum band structure. Uh, for example, uh, for our parameterization, the, the lower band and the upper band are much much better separated, and also uh, it's much better, much more flat, right? So that's true. In fact, that's true. That's, in fact, this is the reason why Farong's um, Farong's uh, flat band approximation works so well mm -hmm. uh, with his experiment, and that's not the case in your. My, my question, my question was both in some sense for Andre and Youngbeck. How do you calculate magnons for a spin liquid? Oh, we, we do not. Um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so maybe I could say, say a little young back. So, so in both mine and, and so young back, we redid the calculation for your models, got exactly the same result as you get, as you got. And so the reason I presented this is um, because there were some parameters different. So in some sense, I chose without, um, without trying to fit the data. The values mm -hmm. in this case from Chernyshev paper, which they okay. claim would explain the data the best. So I put the whole bells and whistles, J3, gamma, gamma prime, just to see what happens. Um, so you're right, there is definitely a degree of, of change. To answer a GIF questions, what both Young Beck and, and we do is that we study the regime either in an applied field. So either you assume that it's a canted, canted antiferromagnet in a zigzag state with a canted moments along the field or that it's already in a fully filled polarized state. It depends on the field value. For the model parameters I use, the transition is about 7.1 Tesla, right? right. So, so yeah. maybe, 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 maybe I can add more information, Rajiv. 
So according to uh, Stephen Nagler's neutron scattering experiment, uh, at least in his sample, if I understand correctly, above like a 10 or 11 Tesla, they did see the magnon, right? So, but on the other hand, uh, uh, if you look at like uh, Hidden's data, then the, they see a kink, kink structure for half magnet, you know, half quantized thermal hole conductivity, like uh, above 11 Tesla, for example, right? And I, I would say, uh, uh, if, if that's the case, then it is strange, right? That 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 you see uh, you see both magnon in that temp in that field range, and at the same time a half quantized thermal hole conductivity. That would be strange, isn't it? So, I mean, you know that that's the data. If that's what data is telling us, then you know we need to explain this, right? Okay, maybe we can uh, take some more question or comment uh, from let's say Stephen. I'll, I'll make a just a follow up to that, and then I'll ask my question. That it, um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that there are some, uh, if not discrepancies, things we don't understand when comparing, say, the terahertz data to the neutron scattering data. In neutron scattering, you see magnons, and by the way, there's a, there's a local minimum in the dispersion at the gamma point, which is a little different from the spectrum. But um, the magnons kind of disappear when you hit this 7.5 tesla whatever is going on there, right, into the disordered phase. And then they reappear at a higher field. So by the time you're up at 10 tesla and you know, up to 13 tesla, which is where we've measured with the field pointing perpendicular to a bond, you do see once again, a sort of sharp magnon at the lower bound. Um, <clears throat> now the terahertz experiments or high field ESR, whatever you want to call them, which are looking only at two equals zero, they see modes going all the way through. Um, but not, not sort of the phenomenology. I, I guess the question I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, you calculated this kappa x, y. Uh, does this model, can it tell you anything about the oscillations just in the regular thermal conductivity uh, seen by Ong? Um No, it, it does not. Um, in computing, what Ong sees, of course, is in longitudinal thermal conductivity. And as you know, there, there is invariably contribution from the phonons, right? How to disentangle that um, is tricky. And on top of it, you know, there are papers from uh, Kim Roche's group, from Lucille Savary and, and Leon Balance, um, suggesting that in fact, those magnetoelastic coupling may be instrumental um, for both kappa XX and kappa XY. And, and that was sort of part of my question in the end is, is whether maybe we should seriously consider phonons. Um, but instead of assuming, let's say like Akim did, that the, they only couple to the edge current because that's the only thing surviving, the only gapless mode surviving in the, uh, in the case of Kitad spin liquid, what if there are sharp magnons um, in the bulk, right? As you, Steve, see in the day. Right, well, we don't, I mean, at eight Tesla, we don't really see sharp magnons with neutron scattering. But of course, they still uh, apparently see modes in, you know, high field ESR. So whether that's a matter of resolution and sensitivity, or we're measuring something different, that's not one hundred percent clear. I mean, the other thing, of course, is as as we saw from Heyang's talk, I mean, given the multitude of phases that might happen there, right, in an applied field. I mean, here uh, we are limited to linear spin wave theory, essentially, right. Um, one could do better, try to do RPA, include magnon magnon interaction into account, but that doesn't answer the fundamental question that Rajiv asked, right? But how do you know that you have well defined magnons to start with? Maybe in some mysterious disordered phase that Kayang showed us. Okay, um, Yuzi, do you want to add some? Yeah, yeah. yeah I have a question uh, to Yon Baka and Andre. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the heat capacity and also thermal conductivity clearly indicates the presence of Dirac cone in, if you apply the magnetic field parity B axis. It's obviously contradictory with the magnum picture. Do you have any opinion to? Well, the calculation yeah, yeah, done uh, here uh, were... Uh, I mean, a gap cross if you, if you apply the multi field parity B axis. So, so, okay, so full disclosure, we did not, uh, we only applied field along A, right? Because that's where I mean, as you pointed out yourself, with the field along B, kappa XY vanishes. 
Um, yeah, yeah, but, but, but uh, gap, gap cross. Correct. Okay, okay. Right. So if you look at the magnon spectrum here, again, it's modular. What's what precise model parameters you use? You see that the mo the minimum of the band around the M point, you know, could be as less than one MeV, um, right? Which I realize is still large, maybe ten Kelvin scale. Uh, but if you could make it smaller by adjusting the parameters of the model, it's not impossible that the magnons um, are low lying in energy. Of course, once they start touching zero, that means you have some form of instability, the mode softening, uh, right? Which would be again consistent with the possibility that you might have multiple phases. And as Hide Takagi said, maybe multiple transitions between different uh, different phases as a sequence as you increase the field. Well, I have a question to you, Ryujuji. Uh, excuse me, can I interject for a second? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, the session chair has to decide whether she wants to have the entire discussion on this one view graph. Um, I was going to stop it actually. We, we because so, Hong Ding has a very sharp schedule, we will have right. to stop promptly at five. So uh, maybe it would be good to have each, at least each view graph shown before mm -hmm. we go back into things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we should move on because um, we start at 7.17. So uh, seven, yeah, so we spend already about uh, 20 minutes on this. Uh, let's move on. So this is Agni. Do you want to make uh, some presentation and some and say about it? And what's okay. the questions? Do you want to address? In five minutes. In five yeah. minutes. I try, okay, I all right. <laughs> I, try, I, try. Well, uh, I am going to speak uh, of purely experimental work on uh, uh, Kagome lattice. And uh, as you know, uh, we already had uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, Roser Valenti uh, told us about uh, the, the, le the left hand side. The, 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 let's start here on, on the left. Uh, this, uh, this is the, what, what one obtains if, if one uses single orbital and uh, tight binding. And you have a, either uh, Dirac cone and uh, flat band, and depending how you feel you, you, the bands, you, you are going to get some topological states. Uh, what I want to show you is a very different system than the one that, which have been mentioned by Rosa Valenti, which is the sodium cobaltate. And the sodium cobaltate, which is here in the case uh, Na1CO2, uh, the, the, co the cobalt here is in, on a triangular lattice. So it's on a triangular lattice and because of the sodium, uh, the sodium gives an electron to the, co to, to the cobalt lattice. And in, uh, in the Na1CO2, you get a splitting due to the crystal field, which makes that you have six electrons uh, on the T2G. And uh, so this is a band insulator without uh, dot. Uh, if you uh, take off some of the sodium, then you reach very interesting situation because the sodium orders, atomic, you have an atomic order of the sodium, which induces a disproportionation on the cobalt sites. And one phase, which is the one on which we have been working recently very, very heavily, is the uh, Na two thirds. Where in this phase, uh, the disproportionation gives you a Kagome, uh, uh, a Kagome lattice. In fact, the Kagome electronic structure that you find out by very careful NMR studies, which showed us that uh, the, the, the cobalt, which are on the Kagome sublattice, are uh, have uh, very different properties from the, the, uh, the complementary cobalt sites. The interesting uh, thing that one sees here, just go sorry on the on the right right hand side, going down, uh, you you find that the the NMR shift that is the spin susceptibility on the Kagome sites uh, has a very curvice uh, temperature dependence. This is the black points on this curve, the, with a very large increase at low temperature, no ordering at all down to the lowest temperatures with uh, uh, reaching uh, constant susceptibility uh, at t equals zero. So it's a real paramagnet all the time, but with a, 
local moment type of behavior. If you plot this susceptibility, you get a curie vice type of behavior with a, a negative uh, vice temperature. Uh, and at the same time, the whole effect shows very strange behavior. This is the red curve, which is a, a negative uh, whole effect at low temperature, which switches to positive whole effect at very high temperature, room temperature. Uh, here. Uh, so this is, uh, this has led us to do very careful uh, 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 transport measurements. In fact, we have ha been able to do very good samples of this material, very reproducible. And you see below the, the right corner, you see there the magneto resistance as measured uh, versus uh, field with going to very high fields. And you see that the magneto resistance has a linear behavior at low temperatures. Here, at the beginning, at the very low, uh, very low field, it's linear. But if you go to high temperature, you find a, a negative magneto resistance with a quadratic behavior. And this is very interesting because the negative magneto resistance here, there is something which looks like local moment uh, uh, behavior. So the, the interesting point of this experiment on the magneto resistance tell us that we have multi, we are going, as you, you will see on the, on the left, we, we are going to get multiband behavior, behavior with at high temperature a negative magneto resistance, at low temperature a positive magneto resistance. And uh, you, if you go to the central uh, 3D representation, this is uh, measure, the conductivity. This, this is the resistivity versus field. Here I show a free, uh, two dimension, three dimensional plot in which I show the conductivity versus temperature and field. And as you can see, uh, you have to be careful, be careful that the, the conductivity is on a log scale and the temperature on the log scale, B is li uh, linear scale. So if you look at, the, at that behavior, you find out that you have very high conductivity at very low temperature at the T equals zero point. Essentially, you have a very high conductivity, which is killed by your field and by, and by temperature very efficiently. And uh, which shows, uh, and in parallel, if you look at the whole effect, the whole effect at, is negative, there switches to positive either with high uh, field or uh, going to high temperature, it, it, it increases. So uh, this shows that we have a, a really a multiband behavior, of course, with a one, the band which uh, a band at multiband, uh, probably there are three or four bands in fact. But uh, at least uh, if you look uh, at this brown uh, range, the brown range corresponds to electron carry, uh, uh, sorry, the, 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 here, the, sorry, ah, I killed my, my screen. I don't see it anymore, merde. <laughs> we I see it. You see it, probably. Yes, I don't, we, I don't we see, see it. it. Yes. I don't know. But, Okay, it's, it's difficult for me to comment without seeing the, uh, ah. <laughs> While you're looking for, maybe I can take one questions. <laughs> Anyone have some? Well, any, anyway, we have multiband behavior uh, mm -hmm. and we have at the same time strong correlations and the multiband behavior looks like being due to, to um, uh, to, the, to the topology of the, uh, of the electronic structure of this uh, compound. Uh, so, sorry, I, uh, you can read the, co the comments which are given. But I don't know why I don't see any more my screen. It's written here that it's multiband behavior field induces changes in the electronic structure, maybe of Lipschitz transitions. Exactly. The, right. the fact that mm -hmm. the, the, we have with increasing field and temperature, we have some leaf sheet transition, which, which means that a small field is, is somewhat killing uh, 
the high conductivity band. This is quite clear when you look at the sigma behavior. A small uh, a field kills the, 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 the you, ha you have carriers which are, uh, very, uh, which are uh, very high mobility, which are killed with a, sm with a rather small field, uh, 10 Tesla or 20 Tesla. And, and uh, then you have this uh, whole like uh, carriers which appear. Uh, so the situation is very, very different from the one which has been described in the, in the so-called Kagome metals, which are superconductors. This one is not a superconductor, by the way, which is so interesting by, uh, by itself, I think, the fact that it's not a superconductor. And okay, so... Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so maybe if you have one uh, question, I'll take and then I we'll see. move on. Uh, if there is none, then we can also move on. Okay, now I see it again. <laughs> so Let I, me ask I a very good question. indicated the, in the... In the Henri, oui? Henri um, you have local moment behavior. You presumably can't describe that by a flat band. That's... But this is the question. Yeah, it could be, it could be a flat band. Yeah. No, it. I I I doubt I doubt it. Um. Why would it be? You think the flat band is pinned at the Fermi energy? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, if if I put the the number of carriers in in this. Uh, uh, in the simple uh, single orbital model, the, we should be totally in the flat band. The Fermi level should be pinned on the flat band. But the, that would be a very unstable state of affairs. Uh, of, co of course, I, I, I am and yet sure. Your, and yet your local moment behavior is robust. Uh, the, the, I think the local moment behavior is, is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, th there is something which looks li like heavy fermions because the local moment behavior appears at high temperature and uh, disappears and gives a Fermi liquid state at low temperature. So it, it seems that there is a band which has a Fermi liquid behavior at, at low temperature uh, with high mobility, which sw switches to local moment behavior when you increase the temperature. Uh, this is why the, the magnetoresistance, which appears at uh, uh, the negative magnetoresistance, appears only at very low temperature, at very high temperature, very high temperature. So we, we are in a situation where the band structure is modified by field and temperature. This is why we speak of a leaf sheet transition. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, mm. uh, we, we need we need really a, a good calculation taking into account spin orbit coupling and holes. And that is not done, of course, in this simple uh, single orbital uh, models. All right. Okay, let's uh, move on. Thank you, Henri. Um, so here you go. Where is... Um... All right. Um... Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So um, so I, I don't I don't feel very qualified, but uh, this is uh, what I prepared for the uh, topological material, magnetic materials, and anomalous uh, Hall effect. So I chose to start from the uh, sort of historical uh, journey uh, uh, of the field. So as you know, this started with the quantum uh, uh, Hall effect, and the 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 fact that you can get a quantized a transverse uh, uh, connectivity with no dissipation. And then uh, there was the quantum spin hole effect. And then the quantum anomalous hole effect uh, um, uh, is the idea that you can get, you can get the same without uh, the need for applying uh, a magnetic field by uh, taking a, a topological insulator and then turning it into a, a, a ferromagnet. Uh, and so this was done uh, first with chromium doped uh, bismuth telluride, and uh, uh, it was observed up to uh, 30 millikelvin, and then it was improved by doing vanadium doped uh, bismuth telluride up to 120 kelvin, and then recently there was this uh, super lattice of manganese uh, bismuth telluride structure, 
that observed it at uh, up to two Kelvin. And so if you look at uh, this, uh, I mean, the way I look at it is, uh, okay, the, the theory is well, well understood and then the next, and it is confirmed. And so the, the next question is, can we see this at room temperature? Uh, and so this is the, uh, the, the the place where if you if you if you look at if you compare this with the, the superconductors it took about a hundred years to reach room temperature um, and so we are just for the quantum anomal anomalous Hall effect we're just at the beginning of this uh, of this <laughs> story um, and so I try to look at what what uh, if there are predictions of like what we need. And again, I, I, I'm not an expert uh, in this, but uh, it seems that what you need is a larger gap so that you know you can still be an insulator at room temperature. And then you need strong spin orbit coupling to get your band inversion and also uh, this, the large gap. Then you're gonna need to have a strong magnetic order to be ferromagnetic still at room temperature. And then all of those materials, uh, they are 2D, mostly uh, MBA grown, uh, with the exception of the of the graphene. Uh, so that 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 is what we need. And so today we had this debate between uh, optimistic and realistic uh, uh, people. So this looks like a list of criteria that makes you optimistic. But if you look at uh, uh, material prediction. Uh, this is uh, giving me some reasons to be less optimistic. Uh, and so, as you know, uh, uh, in 2019, there was this, uh, this really nice effort uh, of high throughput band structure calculation that looked at all of the non-magnetic uh, materials that exist. And, uh, and uh, so th this was really a, a nice effort uh, that, that, you know, can be used to guide uh, the selection of materials for experimentalists. But one thing that came out of this is that the best TI uh, in terms of uh, uh, gap and proximity to Fermi level and so on is in fact the bismuth telluride family. So meaning we're already using, uh, playing with, with the best candidate and doping it with chromium and vanadium. So it's, it's gonna be hard to make, to, to, to come up with another material that already exists that, 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 that will uh, lead us to a much higher temperatures. Um, and so then that means that probably uh, what's gonna work is the kind of uh, super lattices. Uh, and in that case, the predictions are way less uh, reliable, I would say. Uh, and and there, is, there is a question of, can we make those lattices and are they stable and so on. Now, if you, Ask me like what's going to happen in 2022. Um, uh, the follow-up of this uh, nice survey of all materials is that can we can this be done on magnetic uh, materials? And uh, I think there will be like in 2022 at least a list of all the possible uh, topological features that you can get based on symmetry arguments. Uh, same way as what was done for non-magnetic materials. And I'm sure a lot of stuff are gonna come out of this that are very interesting, but uh, it won't probably won't have specific uh, list of materials uh, just for the simple reason that there is not a database of magnetic structure uh, in the same way that there is a database of, you know, just existing crystallographic structures. Uh, so that will probably, uh, make the progress uh, slower, uh, and then and then to uh, sort of the la last last point I wanted to mention uh, is that okay that maybe just the quantum anomalous Hall effect is not just the only interesting thing. Um, one thing that comes out of uh, uh, mixing magnetism and and topology is that you have all kinds of new platforms that are proposed. Um, and, and probably they will, uh, they will lead to other kind of interesting things. Uh, myself, I, I, I don't really uh, know uh, what we can do yet with these kind of things and, and what, what is the end goal. Uh, it seems to me that this sort of uh, uh, 
playing around with the tools and see what can, comes up. And, and I'm fine with that, that that's good. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I wanted to say about uh, topological magnetic materials. I realize I didn't mention uh, everything, of course. Uh, thank you, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so maybe we can take one comment or question on this and see if uh, there is a way to increase the TC of um, this will be very useful for application if we can have one, right? Hello. I don't find any hands up here and given that we don't have much time, we can probably move on. Um, thank you. So those are magnetic materials with some topology. And um, uh, this one is a condo insulator, Onu. Yeah. I I will try to be quick. So if you heard about uh, Chitra's talk in the morning, she described the samarium hexaborides uh, uh, quite nicely. Uh, the Cambridge group sees a uh, large uh, Fermi surface uh, quantum oscillations that they argue that, that are coming from the bulk. Uh, the contrary, uh, the dichotomy comes from the Michigan group uh, experiments which sees only small frequency oscillations that fit to the surface model. And the uh, bulk quantum oscillations were also seen recently in uh, specific heat. Uh, so of course, as theorists, we, would, we want to have fractionalized quasi-particles and the evidence for qu fractionalized quasi-particles apart from the specific heat, uh, um, sorry, Apart from quantum oscillations is the uh, linear specific heat, which seems to be quite robust. But the, on the other hand, there is no uh, thermal conductivity and there are no signatures, uh, low frequency signatures in neutrons. Uh, and since the first experiments came from uh, the Cambridge group about five years ago, now I think everyone agrees that the sample dependence is a key issue to resolve this uh, dichotomy. Uh, and just quickly move on to turbine boron 12. This is another uh, condo insulator or valence fluctuating insulator that also shows quantum oscillations. Uh, in this case, there is uh, both linear specific heat and linear thermal conductivity. But unlike samarium hexaborite, the uh, quantum oscillations only appear near uh, uh, the metal insulator transition, about 10 tesla before the metal insulator transition, where the uh, the material just pretty much breaks down. And uh, the uh, Cambridge group showed that the uh, quantum oscillation amplitude in this case follows the lipschitz kosevich formula. Uh, and uh, so the oscillations that are observed in turbine boron 12, uh, actually uh, the, the frequency of the oscillations also persists into the metallic site, which is also in agreement with the fact that these might be coming from a magnetic breakdown scenario. Uh, and there are some other significant quantum oscillations in other insulators that are not necessarily condo insulators. One is the uh, tungsten tellurite, ditellurite. This is the Bob Covers group. And the other one is the alpha ruthenium chloride, which has been already quite discussed yesterday and today. Okay, that's it for my time. Right, thank you. Um... All right, let's see if we have some questions on the condo insulators. You want to add any um, suggestions or directions to move? Uh, well, obviously, we have to do many more experiments. Why don't we hear Pierce and then maybe have a couple of minutes for questions? I think Hong is yeah. also. Okay, let's do that uh, because we are limited time. So, Pierce. Um, I'm almost embarrassed uh, to talk about this, but let me just. Uh, say a few words about topological superconductors. In some sense, these are the oldest category of topological systems. Uh, helium-3, helium uh, if you look at the top right-hand panel, um, helium-3 was uh, is known top right. <laughs> yeah, helium-3 uh, has surface states, surface Majorana states, but they've actually never been seen. And so there is a lot of effort going on uh, to try and find a way of actually picking up these edge states. It remains an unsolved problem. We feel quite sure they should be there, but they've never been actually detected. 
and this is a, a real challenge for low temperature physics. Um, we'll hear from Hong in the coming talk about um, top left hand corner about what has been very heavily discussed, the issue of uh, what happens when you uh, connect a topological insulator with a, uh, with a trivial superconductor, which then produces a, uh, a topological surface state uh, with Majorana modes. Um, and uh, so this has been a topic of much discussion. Uh, I think one of the questions here is what, what good platforms do we have for this? And Hong will discuss the, the possibility that we might be able to use some iron-based superconductors as such a platform. In that case, in some sense, the, uh, the iron-based superconductor may be its own topological system. Um, and so, uh, so questions about those. Uh, just, just to finish up, uh, there's this whole issue that's come out of the smerum hexaboride, but extends into other systems of the interplay of topology and fractionalization. And uh, uh, we've heard that interesting subject in the context of the Kitaev uh, systems. And these are really interesting from a point of view of field theory. They really lie outside the realm of uh, the Wilsonian description of field theories. They, um, and it's not at all clear that the particle physicists themselves have proper long wave descriptions. But in the context of what we heard, how you might get uh, quantum oscillations in a perfect insulator, uh, there are issues about how the quasiparticles couple to the external vector potential. And any theory that discusses this has to explain how they couple to the external ve vector potential and how it is that that coupling does not give rise to a longitudinal current. Um, and uh, uh, this, uh, th th this issue uh, brings us into the realm of potential connections with failed superconductors. Uh, uh, and uh, um, th this is one way in which you can get these anomalous uh, couplings to the transverse current, but not to the longitudinal current. And so I think the open question here is not what we did, but really the question of how can you, what, what is the key phenomenological description of quasiparticles which couple to a vector potential, but in such a way that you don't get any longitudinal response. Uh, and I think that's a very open question, and it may lead us into the realm that connects us between superconductors and insulators. I'm done, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so thanks to everyone uh, for making contribution. And uh, given the time of interest, uh, I think we can move on and Hong Ding will tell us more about these topological superconductors and RNS. So let me stop share.